the second free response problem from the practice AP test is one that a lot of people often have trouble with. And the reason for that is because this question looks very similar to problems that we had been dealing with in rotation. We have a pulley. It's not a massless pulley. It has some rotational inertia. And then we have a block connected to it, and it's falling down. And we had just been going through and doing rotation problems, and we had looked at these types of problems, finding the, the acceleration but relating it to the rotational inertia and the torque. Um, that does come up in this problem, but only at the end. The first half of this problem does just involve linear motion. So there's a solid disk of unknown mass, and that's one of the key things in this. We don't know the mass of this, so we can't just calculate the rotational inertia as 1 half mr squared. Um, when we go through and at the end calculate what the rotational inertia is, we could then figure out what the mass is from the radius. So we have this unknown mass in radius r that's used as a pulley, and then there's a small block of mass m attached to the string, and then the block of mass m is released from rest, and it takes a time d, a time t, to fall the distance d to the floor. The fact that they have this, that it takes a time t to fall a distance d to the floor, is an important thing. Um, because that is what allows us to be able to solve part A of the question. Part A says, calculate the linear acceleration A of the falling block in terms of the given quantities. And so we have a block that moves a vertical distance D in a time T with a constant acceleration. This is just a kinematics problem. If the acceleration is constant and it's moving in a straight line, which it has to be for the acceleration to be constant, if the acceleration is constant, then you can use kinematics. And since we're given a time, t, and we're given a distance, d, it makes sense to use the position time kinematics equation, where the height equals the initial height plus the initial vertical velocity times t plus one-half times the acceleration times t squared. And so for this problem, you have to decide whether up is going to be the positive or negative direction. Uh, most people usually set this one up with down being the positive direction. So that's the way I'm going to do it. But there would be absolutely nothing wrong with doing this this other way and having a negative acceleration. If I do this, then the initial height If I'm calling down the positive direction, then that means that it's starting at a position 0 and it's ending at a position d. I need the position to increase as I move down if down is my positive direction. So I have d equals 0 plus 0 plus 1 half a t squared. And it asks us to solve this for a. So the acceleration is just 2d over t squared. That's it. That's all they were looking for. Uh, a lot of people try and go through and try and use rotational kinematics and all those things. You will use that. That comes up in a later part to this problem. But this is just a linear motion problem. Okay. Part B. The time is measured for various heights d, and the data is recorded in the following table. What quantities should be graphed in order to best determine the acceleration of the block? And explain your reasoning. So it should be d versus t squared based on what we have in part a. And the reason for that is from part a, we can see that d equals 1 half a times t squared. So that means that the slope of our best fit line is going to equal 1 half a. So for this, explain the reasoning. You have to actually explain how you're going to take your data, how you're going to take your graph, and calculate the acceleration. So my explanation would be from 
part A, I see that the distance is proportional to time squared. And if I graph D versus T squared, that's going to give me a straight line. And the slope of that line equals 1 half A. And so I can solve for the acceleration from that. So that means that I need to calculate time squared. So 0.68 squared is 0.4624. We've got 1.0404, 1.4161, 1.9044. On the grid below, plot the quantities in B. Label the axis and draw the best fit line to the data. So I'm graphing distance on my vertical axis, t squared on my horizontal axis. If I look at those, my distances go from 0 to 2. So it makes sense to make this 0 and 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 2. And my time squareds go from 0.5 up to 1.9. So it makes sense to use the same scaling. That's not always going to work out that way, but this one was pretty nice with that. And so my first data point, D is 0.5, and T squared is 0.46. So that's going to be a point that's somewhere around here. D is 0.5, it's right on that line, and it has to be a little bit to the left of 0 .0, or 0.5 T on the T squared axis. And then the next one, I have d equals 1, and t squared is 1.04. So I'm a little bit past this point. My next one is d is 1.5, t squared is 1.41. Again, if I look along these tick marks, each of these is 0.1. And so 1.41 is a little bit past this tick mark. And then when d is 2, t squared is 1.9. So that would be right around here. So then I draw my best fit line. A line that goes through the data as best as possible. So something around like that would work. I need some data above the axis and some data below the axis. So you had to figure out what you needed to graph in part one. Then you had to actually graph the data. So you had to take the points. You had to graph the points. You had to draw the best fit line. You had to label the axis. Those were all things that they were looking for. And again, I should have that D is in meters and T squared is in seconds squared. So that would be the final steps I would need in labeling my axis. Use your graph to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. So I need to pick two points on my graph. I cannot use data points. Again, looking at that, none of my data points are actually on the line. And so I'm going to use 0.5.5 as one data point and 1.5, 1.5 as my other data point. So my change in y over the change in x is 1.5 minus 0.5 divided by 1.5 minus 0.5, which gives me 1. But that's not the acceleration. I said on the previous page that the acceleration, or that the slope, is a over 2. So the acceleration is 2 times the slope. So my acceleration is 2 times 1, so it's going to be 2 meters per second squared. Okay. Part C. You calculate the rotational inertia of the pulley in terms of m, r, a, and fundamental constants. So to do that, for the block, it has a mass m, it has a weight mg, 
There's a tension T pulling up on it. The tension is less than the weight because this block accelerates down. I'm calling down the positive direction. So I have that the net force is mg minus t. I have that the net force equals ma. So mg minus t equals ma. Or solving that for t, I get that t is mg minus ma. For the pulley, the pulley has this tension T pulling down on it. It has a radius of capital R. And so the torque equals the net torque is R times T. Again, it's the perpendicular component of the force to R. All of the force is perpendicular. The force that I have acting is the tension. And the net torque also equals I times the angular acceleration. So RT equals I times the angular acceleration. I'm able to substitute in for T. So R times the quantity Mg minus Ma equals I times I need all of these to be in the same variables. I'm allowed to answer in terms of m, r, and the linear acceleration and fundamental constant, so that would be g. I can't have the angular acceleration in there, so I need to substitute in that the angular acceleration is a over r. And so if I solve that for i, I get that i equals r squared times mg minus ma over the linear acceleration. This would be the final answer. So this is the spot where you go through and you use Newton's second law for linear motion and rotational motion. You don't do it in part A. Part A is just looking at the straight line motion. And then the final part says, the value of the acceleration found in B, along with the numerical quantities in your answer to C, are used to find the rotational inertia. So you plug in R, M, G, and A, and we calculate a rotational inertia from our data. And then we take the pulley down and we measure its rotational inertia. And we find that it's bigger than our predicted value and give one explanation for this discrepancy. Well, a common thing for people to try and say is that oh, it must be friction, because people try and explain everything by saying that it's friction. But friction wouldn't work here. The reason that friction doesn't work is if there was friction, that would actually cause the rotational inertia to be less than your predicted value. What we there are a couple of possibilities. One of them is you have the wheel, the pulley, and we're assuming that the rope is acting right at the edge. But one of the things that could happen is that if this string is long enough, when it wraps around, it could actually be pulling a significant distance away from the actual edge of the pulley. This rope wrapping on itself is going to cause R to not be exactly what we thought it should be. This is going to cause our measured R to be smaller than what the actual R was. And so what that means is in this equation, if R is smaller 
than it should have been, then that means that our predicted rotational inertia is smaller than it should have been. And that's what this says here, is it says that our rotational inertia is found to be greater than this value. Our measured rotational inertia is greater than our predicted rotational inertia. What we actually measure it after the fact is bigger than what our equation told us that it was. And so having a having r be actually bigger than we thought it was would be one of the ways that would cause this to be off. Another possibility is if the rope was slipping over the pulley. If the rope slips over the pulley, then that causes our acceleration to be a little bit bigger than we would think. It, it changes what the acceleration is. And this would be the opposite of friction. Friction would be working against the motion. It's slipping would be helping it out. And the rope slipping over the pulley would be another possibility for this. So looking at the scoring guidelines, part A was worth two points. One point was for using the kinematics equation for position and time and plugging in D for the distance and the initial velocity of zero. And then it was one point for correctly solving for the acceleration. Pretty simple and straightforward. Part B. It was worth two points. One point was for indicating a correct pair of quantities to graph, and one point was for a correct explanation. And they give a couple possibilities. One is the one that we did. Graph quantities such as d versus t squared, or v versus t. Those give linear graphs, and the slope gives the acceleration. So we graphed d versus t squared. Um, if you did v versus t, you'd have to figure out how you're going to get the velocities. So that causes a bit of a problem, but it technically is a correct thing to do. Method two, graph quantities such as a versus t or a versus x using the equation from part a and determine the accelerations. So what this is doing is that you're finding the acceleration at different spots. Those are going to give linear graphs, and the a intercept will yield the acceleration. You're going to get basically a straight horizontal line, and you're going to plug in your different values of a. That would be OK. That's not, that's definitely not. Um, the suggested method. What we did, d versus t squared, is kind of the best method. Um, method three, graph d versus t, which is parabolic. The equation that describes the best fit curve is quadratic, and the second derivative is the acceleration. So if you could graph the data and somehow figure out what equation fits that data, and then take the second derivative of that equation, that would give you the acceleration. That's not going to be very useful for what we have here, but those would all be correct ways of graphing the information that's given and getting the quantities. It's just not going to, some of them are not going to be as useful for the later parts. So an example of a correct graph, here we have e versus t squared. It looks similar to the one that I had. So it was one point for using data that's consistent with your answer to part b1. So that was we said that we were going to graph d versus t squared. So actually making a graph of d versus t squared and actually calculating the t squared values and graphing those t squared values and graphing the d values, that's one of the points. One point for plotting the data correctly, including labeling the axis and the scales. So you have to have the meters. You have to have the second squared. You have to have that it's d and t squared. And then it was one point for constructing a best fit line or a curve depending on the data graph. And so if you did the parabolic graph and you had a parabola and you drew a best fit parabola to that, that would be OK. Um, that would get you the point. And then actually using the data. So it was one point for using points from the best fit line, not data points. This specifically, in some of the sample uh, scored questions that I saw for this test, if someone actually took their data points, even if their data points were on their best fit line, if they took their data points, they did not get this credit. You need to pick points that 
are not your data points when you're doing best fit lines because your data points might be slightly off on the graph so you might assume that that's right on your best fit line when you might actually have drawn it slightly off it's hard to get it in exactly the right location when you don't have things labeled out to you know you don't have it marked out to the nearest um, hundredths place uh, we don't have a hundred lines breaking it up we only have five lines so our lines are at every point one not every point oh one so you go through, you pick two points on your best fit line. And then it was one point for correctly determining the acceleration, including giving correct units, and explicitly showing how the points give the answer. So saying this two times the slope, actually calculating the slope, doing two times that slope, and getting 2.04. Part C was worth four points. So this was the one that was worth the most. Um, setting up the equation for torque, but not just saying that torque equals I alpha, it's correctly plugging in the torque as it relates to the tension. So RT equals I alpha. It was one point for correctly recognizing that the angular acceleration equals A over R. And then it shows substitute in for the angular acceleration, solve it for i. There's no points there. It was one point for correctly applying Newton's second law for the block. This is giving us our t equation. So having this, even if you didn't know what to, where to go from there, did give you that point. But you needed to go through and actually solve for this tension. And you go through and you substitute it in. So you take this tension, you plug it in to that rotational inertia equation, and you go through and you solve. You get your rotational inertia equation. So actually substituting everything in was that final point. So you do have to do that substitution. An alternate solution, uh, it's not one that I saw. Uh, it's not the most common way of doing it, but you could use conservation of energy. You could look at the potential energy at the beginning being turned into linear kinetic energy of the block and rotational kinetic energy of the pulley. And then you can relate the linear velocity to the angular velocity. You can use the third kinematics equation to relate the linear velocity to the acceleration and the distance. And if you substitute omega in and you substitute v squared in, if you do those substitutions into this equation, we get this somewhat complicated equation and we substitute in our velocities. The velocity is 2AD. We have all of those things. Um, so again, we're substituting in here for that velocity, and we simplify things. We end up getting the same answer. We should. It's still the same problem. But again, this is not the most common way of doing it, uh, but this would be correct. You would get full credit for this alternate solution. And then the last part figuring out why the rotational inertia is off. So for a reasonable analysis of the answer in part C that explicitly indicates either the effective mass or the radius is greater than the given initial paragraph of the question, or the experimental acceleration is greater than it would be without experimental error. Um, and then by it was one point for giving, you know, you have this equation So saying that either your mass was off, so the mass could be greater than what's given, R could have been greater than what was given, or the acceleration is greater than what was given, or greater than what you measured. And so just saying that based on the equation would be one of the points. 
and then actually trying to physically explain how that could be off. You know, to try and explain why the radius would actually be bigger than what you thought it was. And so they give that ex example. The string was wrapped around the pulley several times, causing the effective radius at which the torque acted to be larger than the radius of the pulley. And, and that would be enough. Or saying that the string slipped on the pulley, allowing the block to accelerate faster than it would have otherwise, resulting in a smaller experimental moment of inertia. Um, and again, they have this note. Friction is not an acceptable answer, since the presence of friction would make the experimental value of the moment of inertia too large instead of too small. And then the commentary from their head grader that year. The intent of this question, it was intended to begin as a straightforward one-dimensional kinematics problem and then look at graphing data. Again, this is something that in the past 10 years, they've started including a lot more of taking data, graphing data, trying to figure things out from data. So being able to figure out what things to graph to get a straight line relationship are extremely important things. Um, so use the graph to find the acceleration. And then part C of the problem is where you apply rotational dynamics. And then part D was to figure out experimental error. How well did students perform? It was lower than expected. The average score was 5 out of 15. It, we saw in the first problem that the average score was 8.7 out of 15. So the average score was only a third of the points. Slightly more than 4% of the students earned a score of 12 or higher. Again, that's not a very large percentage. Um, that means that I, there were a decent number of people that were in the 8, 9, 10, 11 point range. Um, and if you could get half the credit on this one, you were ahead of the game. You know, so you know, when I tell you, go through and try and average about eight points on things, well, so maybe you get less than eight on this one. Maybe you get the average of five. So then you definitely want to get, you know, more than eight points in the last one, which between the two questions is going to put you ahead of the national average. 37% of students earned a score of three or less, and 2% of the people did not even attempt the question, which means that many students tried the problem with little success. So if 37% of the people got three or less points, but only 2% didn't even attempt it, then that means that there was 35% that tried the problem and barely got any points. Um, this was not a very good question in terms of student performance, but it was a straightforward question. And so many students failed to realize that part A was a simple kinematics problem, and they immediately tried to look at rotation. Uh, the graphical analysis also posed problems for many students, showing that they're unfamiliar with manipulating data in order to obtain a linear graph. Again, the fact that they're saying that specifically, this has become an emphasis of the people writing the test. So you definitely need to know how to do graphical analysis. It's going to probably come up in one problem. It's almost for sure going to come up in one problem. The final part of the problem also created difficulties for many because the problem was worded in such a way that friction, which is the most common answer that people always give for disagreements between theoretical and experimental quantities, was not the correct answer. There was no way that friction could actually cause that answer. A lack of friction could work, but definitely not saying that there was friction. Um, and so, again, try not to fall into a trap of immediately looking at the problem and assuming that it's like one that we have already done. That's what a lot of people did. They saw the pulley and the block and saw that the pulley had some mass to it, so it, they knew that there was some rotation stuff, so they immediately assumed that it was the rotation problem. That's a good thing to, to be able to recognize that, but make sure that you read the questions carefully to see if you're trying to do that for that part. It does come up in that problem, but there might be some things that are a little bit more straightforward. Again, with some practice on this problem, this would allow you to solve a lot of problems like this. They like those Atwood's machine type problems with the pulley and the blocks falling, especially with rotational inertia. 
Um, so you definitely want to look at that, but you want to be able to do this if there is, if it is just something where you're using energy and you're not using uh, Newton's second law, or you need to know how to do it when you are using Newton's second law, or you need to know when you're just looking at kinematics. Those are three slightly different variations of those problems. They have had all of those on in the recent past. And so you should be able to go through and try and identify all those things.